Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge, and this is The National. I was going to fire Comey, my decision. Donald Trump offers another twist over why James Comey was fired, and part of the story may be crumbling. Is it accurate that the rank and file no longer supported Director Comey? No, sir, that is not accurate. Air Canada is switching loyalty programs. Will that strand customers? Now's the time to start using up those miles. And on that issue, could the Trump presidency actually be in serious jeopardy? And if so, what does it mean to Canada? Plus, Rex is here. After stumbling and then finally settling on a story about how and why Donald Trump fired the director of the FBI, White House officials held fast against an onslaught of questions. They said the president was prompted by the recommendation of others. The director, James Comey, had lost the confidence of the bureau itself. But in the space of a few hours today, all of that fell apart. Paul Hunter has more. If you thought things couldn't get any more complicated for Donald Trump, consider Capitol Hill today and the acting, An acting director, director of the FBI, Day. Andrew McCabe. But simply put, sir, you cannot stop the men and women of the FBI from doing the right thing. McCabe has stepped in for James Comey, stunningly fired by Trump two days ago. Today, McCabe sat down before U.S. senators and directly contradicted a string of positions taken by the White House on the Comey turmoil. On the White House view, Comey had lost the backing of FBI rank and file, said McCabe today. No, sir, that is not accurate. I can confidently tell you that the majority, the vast majority of FBI employees enjoyed a deep and positive connection to Director Comey. And on the White House position, the FBI's investigation into possible collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia is low-level stuff. Sir, we consider it to be a highly significant investigation. And until he was fired, Comey had led that investigation. McCabe underlined it will continue. And on it went. And then it was Trump's turn on Comey. Look, he's a showboat, he's a grandstander. In an interview with NBC News, he seemingly contradicted himself on the firing. Trump wrote to Comey Tuesday, I have accepted the recommendation of the Attorney General and the Deputy AG, and you are hereby terminated. But amid reports the Deputy Attorney General says it played out differently, Trump today offered a different version. I was going to fire Comey. My decision. It was not... You had made the decision before they came I, in. I was going to fire Comey. All of it leaving White House spokespeople scrambling and reporters wondering who and what to even believe. Instead of getting so lost in the process, did this happen at 12.01 or 12.02? Did he fire him because he wore a red tie or a blue tie? He fired him because he was not fit to do the job. It's that simple. And yet, no, so many Americans, Trump had long praised Comey. And the firing came soon after Comey testified that that Russian investigation continues. With other reports, Comey had even wanted more resources for it. On that, Trump also repeated today that Comey had told him directly that he himself was not under investigation. Three times, says Trump. A suggestion Comey associates tonight reportedly label farcical. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. In the contradictions and mixed messages around the firing of Comey, some see a White House press office in distress. And the symbol of that distress circulating widely online is Sean Spicer. When the story broke on Tuesday, Spicer emerged from the bushes of the White House lawn, demanding cameras and lights be turned off to give a, an impromptu press conference. That strange image has become an internet meme, mocked on social media, and adding to a catalog of pop culture critiques of the beleaguered Trump spokesman. The Prime Minister has named the new head of CSIS, and no, it's not James Comey. David Vigno has a long career in security at CSIS, Canada Border Services Agency, and Canada's Cyber Spy Agency. He's currently Assistant Secretary to the Cabinet for Security and Intelligence. Vigno starts the new job June the 19th. 
Canadian giant Bombardier is still paying for the price for doling out huge bonuses to its executives while receiving government bailouts. Today, it announced its executive chairman, Pierre Baudouin, is giving up that role. Baudouin became the target of public protests and shareholder anger in the wake of the bonus scandal. He will retain his position as board chairman. Well, if you have a wallet full of loyalty cards, you're in good company. A recent survey found about 90% of Canadian respondents are part of at least one program. So the news that Air Canada is leaving Aeroplan behind prompted many a cry of, what about my points? With the reassurance that points are safe, Havard Gould wanted to know more and found out this could actually be good news for everyone. This morning, instantly, there was anxiety in the air. Five million Aeroplan members concerned. I'm disappointed. I've been saving miles for, I don't know, probably 20 years. But for millions more Canadians, including those who have never collected a single Aeroplan mile, opportunity may be on the way. First, the losers. People who have been hoarding Aeroplan miles for years for a major trip should be wary. Not much will change for three years, and even after that, it will still be possible to buy Air Canada flights with Aeroplan miles. But flights with Air Canada's partners three years from now don't appear to be in the cards. Big piles of carefully collected Aeroplan miles will likely be useless on Lufthansa, United and many more carriers. If you've been planning for some sort of dream vacation in a premium class on one of these really world-class airlines like Singapore Airlines as an example, now's the time to start using up those miles uh, because we don't know what the, the future holds. Who wins? Maybe a lot of people. The Canadian reward space just got a lot more interesting. Air Canada is already hinting its new frequent flyer program will offer generous sign-up bonuses. Aeroplan, which is a separate company, says it is working on ways to keep its customers and keep them happy. Played right, this could be a great thing for a Canadian base. This blogger who tracks loyalty programs says a bidding war for customers is coming. Look for a barrage of bonuses and offers from airlines, banks, credit card companies and others. The battle likely to start with Aeroplan members and spread. Any time there's a new player in the market, so to speak, uh, they will throw some uh, candies at the membership. It's often said of loyalty programs, the key is to earn and burn. Use up the points before something happens that makes them harder to cash in or worth less. Many Aeroplan collectors are extra eager to do just that now, but more points of all kinds may soon be flying around. Howard Gould, CBC News, Toronto. Coming up. Andrew, Chantel, and Paul Wells on the Comey crisis and what it means here. Plus, the Greens make gains in British Columbia. Rex has some thoughts on that. So you've probably heard the news by now. Moody's has downgraded Canada's big banks. Have you figured out what that means? Most agree that it's a red flag, but not a sign that something bad is about to happen. The so-called big six banks were all lowered by one ratings point. A couple of things to keep in mind. Canada's banks are still in the top tier of Moody's rating system. And Moody's did exactly this four years ago, and it didn't really affect the bank's business. Still, today's downgrade came in response to the very real high debt levels Canadians are carrying and the record high home prices in cities right across this country. Rene Filipponi has more. A gold standard of stability. Canada's big banks were slightly shaken today. Their credit ratings downgraded over concerns about debt and housing prices, sending a message to investors about potential risk. This is a system-wide problem. Um, the operating environment affects all the banks fairly closely uh, in alignment. This is not a positive thing. This is not the attention that we want to draw. The downgrade could make it more expensive for banks to borrow money, and that may get passed on to consumers in the form of higher interest rates or bank fees. I mean, this is early days. I mean, this has just happened, and we have to see how the markets respond. 
Concerns about the hot housing industry are nothing new. Yeah, of course it's vulnerable to a correction. The Bank of Canada governor has been flagging it for years, along with Canadians' record high personal debt levels. The worry, just how vulnerable is the economy and what would happen if there was a major global shock. If I'm unable to make a fair deal for the United States, meaning a fair deal for our workers and our companies, I will terminate NAFTA. President Trump's stance on trade could be that shock. You know, our dollar will fall even further if we lose jobs because of any kind of thickening of the borders because of trade. Lost jobs mean more people can't afford to buy homes or pay off their debt. Various levels of government have taken action to cool the housing market, but some argue it's not enough. I'm hopeful that this downgrade increases the pressure on the stakeholders in Canada to really do more to try to slow the rate of growth in housing. Moody's failed to forecast the 2008 U.S. housing crash, and some economists say this downgrade is a cautious move and that danger isn't just around the corner. But it is a reminder that high levels of debt and soaring housing prices have created risks for Canada's economy that are being noticed beyond our borders. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Toronto. To BC now, where flooding may be about to get a whole lot worse. Hundreds of homes in the central part of the province are already under evacuation orders, and more may follow, mostly around Kelowna, where water levels are dangerously high. Some flooding has already occurred, and with heavy rain starting tonight, officials say residents should prepare for the worst. Over the next few days, we will see water levels in our city, particularly in creeks and in our lakes, reach levels we've never seen before. So CBC's Briar Stewart is in Kelowna tonight. Briar. Well, Peter, the rain hasn't started yet, but it's on the way, and that is the big concern. The ground here is saturated. The lakes, streams, and reservoirs are basically full, so there's nowhere for that water to go except over land, and that's why officials are so concerned that there could be unprecedented levels of flooding and that it could affect a wide swath of downtown. Now, officials have been uh, reinforcing dikes along municipal infrastructure, and there's a number of spots in the city where residents can go and fill up sandbags. Now, there were homes that were impacted by flooding over the weekend. So there are some residents who have spent the last couple of days pumping out their basement, trying to clean up, and now they're kind of back out on the street, filling up sandbags again, getting ready for what could be a much worse round two. Now, there are about 440 homes that are under an evacuation alert at the moment, but officials are warning all residents to be prepared, even if they live on higher ground, because the rain uh, could cause washouts or mudslides. So they're urging everybody to have an emergency kit to be prepared for the worst and just hope it doesn't get to that. Peter. All right, Breyer, thanks very much. In Quebec, the threat of flooding still is not over, at least in one region of the province. But some serious help arrived today to prevent more disaster. A Navy frigate, HMCS Montreal, arrived in the port of Trois-Rivières. Its crew of 160 is helping build up flood defenses in advance of heavy rains expected in the area this weekend. But in the rest of Quebec and in Ontario, flood levels are slowly subsiding from record highs. Today, the Prime Minister and the Quebec Premier had an aerial tour of one of the worst affected areas near Gatineau. Later, the PM said governments must develop better rebuilding plans in expectation of more frequent flooding due to climate change. And that's exactly what one Alberta town did after suffering $5 billion in flood damage a few years ago. But to protect High River from future disaster, some painful choices had to be made. Carolyn Dunn has that story. Just under four years ago, the town of High River was a disaster area. The entire town, 13,000 people, was evacuated. More than 3,000 homes were damaged. Today, High River is a very different town. We've got protection measures in place. Again, most well-protected community in Canada from flood risk. It costs nearly $400 million, but there's a 10-kilometer berm, a barrier between the river and the town. Bonus? They double as walking trails. And they've replaced old clay sewer lines. Gave the downtown a facelift too. Huge projects, but nothing compared to telling 122 families they'll never go home again. As hard as it is, you have to go there. You have to. 
or else you're just going to continue to make the same mistakes year after year after year. In much of the province, people were allowed to rebuild on the floodplain at their own risk. There will be no government compensation if their homes are flooded again. But homeowners in two High River neighbourhoods were given no choice. The risk of flooding again just too high. See how thick right. the silt is there? Yeah. Photographer Jane Russell and her husband were relieved to be bought out of their home by the government. After the flood, Russell says it looked like it had been hit by a bomb. As soon as I saw that, I'm like, I can't live here. Still, from her new home on much higher ground in High River, Russell admits moving on was hard. Because we loved it there. We loved our home. We loved that area. It, you have to let go. A few of her neighbours didn't want to let it go. They fought the mandatory buyout and ended up having their land expropriated anyway. With extreme weather events on the rise, the mayor stands by the decision and sees it as a lesson for other flood-prone communities. Those are the kinds of decisions that our politicians have to start making so that we're not paying for this stuff year after year after year. Because even though the Highwood River isn't raging now, that can change in a flash. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, High River, Alberta. Coming up, desperate to take the edge off, addicts turn to an unusual over-the-counter medication. National with Peter Mansbridge. Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. I'm Peter Mansbridge, and this is the National. Well, we are a long way from our usual cozy studio tonight. It's about 3,000 kilometers that way. This is the Northwest Passage. We're in a shaft at the old syndicate coal mines here in. Spring Hill, Nova Scotia. These are unusual surroundings for the National. We're about an hour north of Fort McMurray. From Stratford, Ontario. In Delta, British Columbia. From Parliament Hill. In Saskatoon. Going live off the deck of an icebreaker. In Vancouver. From Montreal, once again tonight, a city at the heart of a crisis in the cold. Do you worry about the ice? Yes, I do, yeah. Um, what's gonna happen if it all melts, melts away? All jolly we miner men, and miner men are we. They've all worked the coal mines in Cape Breton. Now they sing to preserve the heritage and the folklore of the island's mining communities. <laughs> Canada is still here tonight, but just barely. Quebecers have voted no to sovereignty. But of course, the story the whole world is watching is the historic switch to the year 2000. This is the day that Winnipeg has been waiting for worrying about, even dreading. Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge from downtown Toronto. For the most part, an eerily dark Toronto. Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge inside Vatican City. Good evening from the Netherlands, Baghdad. In Tiananmen Square tonight from London. In Vimy Ridge, France. From Kandahar, Afghanistan. Here in Berlin, there's another opening in the wall tonight, number 22. When the waves crashed ashore here and they didn't have far to come, there's the beach line. Our ride today is on an Israeli Air Force Black Hawk helicopter. That is the area that the suicide bombers use to get to some of their targets. Look at those. Those are the papal apartments just over on the other side. That's where the Pope lives. As night falls, we're back on the road, moving through the streets of Kandahar, and as always, on the lookout. Thanks for watching. Horrific accident on part of the Trans-Canada Highway claimed the lives of four people today. It happened early this morning on Highway 401 east of Kingston, Ontario. A seven-vehicle crash left one car in flames. All of the victims were inside. Two people in another vehicle were seriously injured. The cause of the crash is not known. It's easy to get widely used and safe, at least under normal circumstances. But there are growing concerns about a common over-the-counter medication because of abuse by drug addicts. 
and the risk of sudden death. Cass Rusi explains. Everything okay? A popular drug known for oh, rapid relief. Your diarrhea! The brand name is Imodium, an over-the-counter drug that treats diarrhea. The main ingredient, loperamide, is an opioid. It's cheap and easy to get, and for drug users, it offers a different kind of relief. Drug abusers, opioid seekers, they are desperate. They need this medication to help with the withdrawal or to achieve that euphoric state. The standard dose for Imodium is 16 milligrams, or eight tablets a day. But it's not uncommon for drug abusers to take the medication in much higher amounts, up to 200 tablets a day for that euphoric high. And that's when it can get fatal. Sort of a double whammy with this loperamide. It can cause slowed breathing or even stopping breathing, similar to other opioids, but it also can cause direct effects on the heart. It's the sort of thing that people can do for, you know, weeks or months at a time with no symptoms at all, and then suddenly they just drop dead. Last year, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration issued a safety alert warning that higher than recommended doses of Imodium can cause serious heart problems that can lead to death. While the Ontario Poison Centre reports only a couple of cases of Imodium poisoning so far, it's not the entire picture. We are starting to see more and more people coming to hospital or just dying suddenly at home, courtesy of, of this drug, that most of us perceive as pretty innocuous. A soon-to-be-released review co-authored by Dr. Urlink warns Canada's emergency room physicians to be on the lookout for increasing misuse and abuse of loperamide. A challenge for doctors because the go-to antidote, naloxone, works to reverse an opioid overdose, but can't fix heart problems caused by this medication. Health Canada says it's aware of the health warnings for Imodium in the U.S. and will continue to monitor the safety of the drug here. But some pharmacists want to restrict the sale of Imodium, calling for the diarrhea drug to be placed behind the counter. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Toronto. Visitors to Canada's largest zoo were turned away today after a strike by zoo workers forced its closure. Oh, it's sad. It's supposed to be one of the main attractions of coming to Toronto. So. About 400 unionized employees at the Toronto Zoo walked off the job early this morning after contract talks on job security broke down. Maintenance workers and zookeepers are among those on strike. Until they're back on the job, administrative staff will be taking care of the zoo's 5,000 animals. Your Thursday night regulars at issue and Rex are up next, and then later. You don't simply cure your disability or transcend your disability. It's something that you live with every day. Educating artists against using disability as a crutch. That's all coming up on The National. First look at today's business numbers, the TSX fell 82 points, the dollar dropped two-tenths of a cent. In New York, the Dow lost 23 points, the price of oil closed up 50 cents a barrel. Well, hello there, Facebook Live fans. Um, Got to get organized here for you. Uh, we got four minutes before that issue is up. So let's get to uh, your questions as quickly as we can. Uh, Nathan Lau asks, how long have you been a news anchor? Uh, thanks, Nathan. Uh, almost 30 years now, named in 1987 to anchor the National. I'd done some anchoring on the weekends before then. Uh, 20 years a reporter before anchoring. Penny Torrens asks, a uh, must-see movie you highly recommend. <laughs> Guys, you're really getting to the substantive stuff tonight, right? If you haven't seen Casablanca yet, it is still the best movie ever made, in my view. And there have been a lot of good movies made since then. But that goes back to the 40s. Terrific movie. Always entertaining. I've probably seen it 30 times. Ellen Wang asks, can you name and recommend your top three books to read? Uh, I won't give you three, but I'll give uh, the current one that I've just finished reading. Highly recommend it. Paul Watson, Canadian. Um... It's called Ice Ghosts. It's been highly reviewed in, uh, in the States and the New York Times, and it's now uh, just on sale now in, uh, in Britain as well. It's the story of the Franklin Expedition. And this one is told without any, any of the hype and other 
kind of things <laughs> that you've seen in some of the books that have been written on the Franklin Expedition. This is the real story on the expedition and uh, on the two big finds of uh, two of the Franklin ships, or the two Franklin ships in the last uh, couple of years. Paul Watson, Ice Ghost, highly recommend it. Uh, Laura on Twitter asks, we really need to increase discussion of racism in Canada as well as black Canadian perspectives. When will we see more black panelists? It's a good question. It's one we're always working on, on any number of different panels. Um, and, you know, I think it's a good point. And we're working uh, to increase the number of uh, participants of all diverse um, backgrounds on all our panels. Victoria Stevens asks, what was one of the funniest blooper moments you remember from your career in journalism? I've never made a mistake. I have no bloopers at all in my background. Kill that tape right now, please. Um, hey, there have been lots of them. Perhaps, perhaps the, 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 the most difficult moment for me was when I misidentified Princess Margaret getting off a plane in Winnipeg in a live broadcast. It was actually the Air Canada flight attendant. That wasn't a great moment in my career. Um, Benjamin Van Drorp asks, Hey, Peter, have you planned your first day of retirement? If so, what do you think it will look like? There'll be a beach, sand, water, and I'll be just looking out into the ocean. It'll be a great day. One minute. R one minute. Thanks, Al. Rosaire Durrell asks, Who was your favorite news anchor growing up? Walter Cronkite. Nick Schaus asks, how do you decide which candidate to vote for in an election? What does it take? Well, I'm no different than anybody else. You make your decisions about voting. You know, you know, unless you've grown up in a family that always votes one particular way and you want to carry on that tradition, you make your decisions about voting on who you think the best candidate is in your riding uh, based on some of the issues that, uh, that concern you the most and, and the stands they take on them. Um, Brennan Fitzgerald, what do you think is the most pressing challenge facing Canada today? I think we all have our own different opinions on that one. I still think climate change is the, uh, is the big okay. issue confronting us. Uh, okay, listen, thanks for all your questions. Lots of uh, good ones there. It's time now for that issue, though. We're going to talk Donald Trump, and it starts right now. He's a showboat. He's a grandstander. The FBI has been in turmoil. You know that. I know that. Everybody knows that. Donald Trump on James Comey, proving once again that you've got to be one to know one. You know, it's become popular to talk about the death of journalism, especially print journalism. But hold on. One man has come to the rescue. He's single-handedly been responsible for some of the best political journalism of the past 50 years, and readers are responding by signing up. Just look to the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. Watching with fascination at the seeming implosion of the Donald Trump presidency, Andrew is here in Toronto, Chantel in Montreal, and Paul Wells, senior writer for McLean's, is in Ottawa. It's been quite the week on the Comey story. And while it's not our normal turf, like everybody else in this country, or most everybody else, we've been talking about Trump all week. Uh, what do you make of this and the story that's unfolding in Washington? Andrew? Well, just to preface this, of course, we all have a stake in this. The whole world does. The president of the United States is, you know, part of all of our lives and fortunes. Uh, look, Donald Trump has been crossing lines ever since he burst on the scene uh, politically, uh, but he crossed yet another line and perhaps the most serious one yet this week. Um, if you are under investigation, your administration, several of your closest associates are by the FBI, and you fire the head of the FBI, I don't care what other construction you want to put on it, that is a prima facie case of obstruction of justice. Uh, it is, for anybody in a, in a lower situation, it would be grounds uh, for criminal charges, perhaps, and certainly for dismissal. The president's a different kettle of fish. It's innately political. But he has, I think, uh, set off more alarm bells than ever before because one of the comforting assumptions that a lot of us tried to reassure ourselves with was, well, he's Donald Trump, yes, he's the president, but the United States is a system of checks and balances, and ultimately he'll have to work within that. Uh, all of that depends upon the president, in that case, being willing to be so bound. And everything we know about Trump is he observes no boundaries, no norms of any kind, and he's just proven it yet again in the most serious possible way. Chantel? 
what struck me beyond uh, all of that uh, is the disarray that attended to executing this. Uh, it's, yes, a very serious business to fire the person who is uh, investigating you, but to not be able to stick to a, a version, a narrative as to why you do it also shows something about the White House uh, and the, the dysfunctionality of the place that has to worry anyone that has to deal with that White House. If, if anyone in this country had tried to do this and then messed up and trying to explain it and the way that these people have contradicted themselves, uh, you would have thought this is a dead man or a dead woman prime minister walking. You know, Paul, I don't know about you, but I've had a hard time tearing myself away from the, from the television all week watching this because, as Chantal says, it, it just seems to bounce from one excuse to another. Uh, none of them seem to work and, and he seems to get deeper uh, into the mire of all this. What, what do you make of it? Well, so one of, to some extent, almost one of the less important side effects of this has been the shredding of the career of a guy named Rod Rosenstein, who's the deputy attorney general, a highly respected attorney whose confirmation uh, by Congress was a slam dunk because, uh, because uh, on both sides of the aisle, they figured he was a pretty straight up guy. His justification for this dismissal was a transparent fig leaf, which is the worst kind of fig leaf. And um, he, <laughs> <laughs> not a nice picture. No. <laughs> and uh, by all accounts, uh, and Lord knows there's plenty of anonymous sources to fuel these accounts, he spent the last 36 hours running around trying to, uh, trying to salvage his reputation, trying to get the rest of the White House to communicate uh, his memo the way he wants it. The, but the upshot is you can't get close to this president and survive intact. And while it's possible to, uh, to come up with some justification for firing Jim Comey, he was a highly controversial uh, FBI chief. He himself said that his behavior during the election cycle last year caused him a, tin a tinge of nausea when he contemplated it. Um, uh, the, almost the, 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 the one guy in the world who shouldn't be firing him is the president he's investigating. Uh, and uh, the thing, I think the one thing we can be sure of is that it will get worse, that this is not the worst day of the Trump presidency, that many worse days lie ahead. Well, you know, we, we've, we've seen a lot of worse days already in this presidency, but he always seems to some, somehow find a way to wiggle out. Is he, what about this time? I mean, a week from now, are we going to say, oh, yeah, well, that was last week? Well, a week from now, to me, he's a bit like a squirrel. He keeps jumping from branch to branch. Someone saws off the branch, he jumps to another one. So a week from now, we may be talking about a very different crisis. Uh, because that has been the pattern. The distraction or diversion has been to jump from one mess to the next mess. Yeah, but the, but the thing that's been a constant drumbeat all through the last several weeks and months has been this Russia business. Now, nobody can prove anything at this point. It's part of an investigation. It's not, we're not at the stage of laying charges or anything. But it continues. And obviously, Trump, to so, so far as he calculated this at all and just didn't react in a fit of pique, must have felt that he could ride out the political and media uh, thunderstorm, whatever the word I'm looking for, the firestorm that would come out of that, uh, um, that it'd be worse if, if the, the, the investigation actually made any headway. But the investigation will be knocked back by this, there's no doubt. And they've, to be fair to them, they've now freely confessed, or not freely confessed, but eventually confessed that, in fact, that was what they were trying to do. But there's congressional inquiries. There are now a lot of really angry FBI officers uh, looking into this. Um, I don't think this is going to succeed in putting that story away. As John McCain loves to keep saying, you know, this thing has so many shoes yet to fall, it, it's a centipede. Uh, so I don't think he's going to be able to, to put that away. And that is really the allegations, unproven as they are, in the, uh, the suspicions in the Russia affair are so serious, I don't think even he could survive. You know, Paul, uh, Andrew said right off the top that, you know, the President of the United States, when, when something's happening around him, we should all be you know watching and, and concerned has an impact on everybody in terms of Canada you know a, a Trump presidency presidency in this kind of trouble what impact does it have well uh, there's an awful lot of, of decisions that uh, the Canadians have been uh, putting uh, on hold including uh, just to name one off the top of my head the peacekeeping mission potential peacekeeping mission in Africa which they'd like the Americans to sign off on if they're going to go ahead with it 
the Americans are not in a lot of uh, mood or situation to be holding these kind of close consultations on these bilateral files. So a lot of things are going to remain on hold. And then there's that, that long story I just told about this uh, Deputy AG, uh, Rod Rosenstein. Uh, and the lesson I was, people who think they can work closely with this president and, uh, and emerge unscathed are, are more and more often turning out to be wrong. One of those people is Justin Trudeau. And I'm wondering at what point, he's already been, been, been recruited by people inside the White House to weigh in on internal White House disputes. Uh, that's flying awful close to, uh, to the sun there, and I don't, I, I'm not sure he's going to escape unsinged for long. Yeah, I mean, a weakened tr Trump is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it makes it harder for, his, for him to get his agenda through. So uh, if the Trudeau government was worried that they'd have to make sweeping tax reform, you know, to that, to that extent, tax reform is, is harder to get through the Congress. Similarly, uh, they'll, be, they'll be not as strong on, on trade things. But the danger is, of course, is that somebody who's weakened lashes out, tries to create uh, external threats, tries to create enemies. Uh, and bizarrely enough, we seem to have been one of them. Well, yeah. uh, and, and the weak president, that weak president, needs wins. And those wins, uh, uh, I, I think he believes that uh, his base doesn't really care about uh, Russia uh, meddling inquiry. Uh, and if he's going to try to shore up his support, he's going to be hitting at things that are pocketbook issues. And here we are, Canada's... Uh, mm, biggest trading partner, the U.S. You saw, you had a sample of it a couple of weeks ago. The danger is that as he veers into damage control mode, he turns to the easiest target and that's us. Um, let's hear from the biggest winner of the week, because there was a winner this week, <laughs> and, uh, not south of the border, but right here in Canada. His name is uh, Andrew Weaver. He's the leader of the Green Party in British Columbia, only won three seats, but he appears to be holding the balance of power in that province. Uh, final count still to come. Um, I talked to him last night. Here's what he says he cares about and wants to deal with as a result of the situation he's in right now. Watch this. The number one issue that we've been very clear with since day one is we need to ban big money out of BC politics. The New York Times called us the Wild West. This is a deal breaker for us. We also believe firmly that our democracy is broken here in British Columbia and we would like to see uh, discussions about proportional representation. It's another important issue to us. Healthcare, environmental issues. There's many, many, many issues facing us in British Columbia and, and that's why you know everything's on the table right now in the next few days as we start discussions. So the question here is, uh, what does the rest of Canada take from the success of the Green Party? Not only the three seats, but also a good chunk of the uh, share of the vote. What's the lesson as a result of that BC vote, Andrew? Well, first of all, as with any kind of breakthrough, it shows that it can happen. Now, BC is a particular political culture, but uh, the Greens, even, even by the BC standards, did is better than they've ever done. 17% of the vote, nearly. Uh, secondly, of course, this is going to have potential effects in terms of uh, if they're able to bring in electoral reform, if, if the Greens are successfully able to parlay their demand for that. We'll have to see, of course, on, on how the negotiations go. That creates a demonstration project if it happens in BC. If it, if, probably they'd have to have a referendum, but let's suppose it, it, it gets through in BC, then you've got a working model of it actually on Canadian soil and it's harder to dismiss it as some kind of theoretical curiosity. And of course the biggest uh, um, thing perhaps for this, uh, for the federal government is what does this all mean for uh, the Trans Mountain Pipeline and I don't know the answer to that, I'm not sure anybody does. It doesn't sound good. Paul. It's extraordinary to me that Mr. Weaver, who runs a nominally Green Party, is listing environmental issues fourth on his list of desiderata as he, as he tries to pick a government. Uh, but I guess I shouldn't be surprised. He's right that the Wild West fundraising culture in, in British Columbia is mind-boggling to those of us who've, who've, who've been uh, following a, a, a relatively cleaner uh, set up in, in, in Ottawa. The, the, the amount of private sector money that sloshes around those parties, pr principally Christy Clark's <laughs> Liberal Party, is extraordinary. But uh, I guess the other lesson I would draw is that uh, federal Greens who are hoping to, to, to benefit or, or, or to transfer the British Columbia experience nationally need to look at the differences. Weaver was a first-time leader, fresh, new to, uh, to BC voters, and he was running in, uh, in a context where BC voters were trying to avoid a polarized liberal NDP choice. They were looking around for a third option. In, at the federal level, 
Elizabeth May has run has won less of the popular vote every time she's gone at bat. She's now been leader of the Green Party for 11 years, uh, and she's uh, almost uh, certain to be facing a very polarized electorate next time. So I, I wouldn't take a lot of hope if I was a federal Green looking at the B.C. Greens experience. John Tell. Oh, if I were the um, Ontario Liberals at Queen's Park, I'd be looking at what happens when you're asking for a fifth man mandate. Mm -hmm. And I'd notice that uh, a good economy, and that was the case in BC, did not really uh, make the difference that uh, Christy Clark could have hoped for. So uh, fatigue ma drives people to vote in all kinds of directions. In this case, the Green Party was one of the beneficiaries. But uh, you do see it in, in other major provinces. The NDP uh, that broke the mold in Alberta. In Quebec, we have four parties now sitting in the National Assembly, where there used to be a two-party system. And that's been going on for a number of years. So uh, for an established party, and here I probably mean the NDP, I guess it's time to seriously look at, at how you fit in that universe and whether those smaller parties uh, are going to prevent you from ever getting closer to power. If I were the Greens, I'd be playing for PR first and foremost. They, they can probably get the campaign finance from either of the two big parties. It, neither of them would like it, but both of them have said that they would look at reforming it. Uh, playing for Trans Mountain, you might get them to oppose it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you stop it. I mean, the feds are pretty determined to see this go through. PR, it seems to me, is, the, is a long-term win for the Greens that's, that's worth everything else. If they can make themselves permanent players in the British Columbia political landscape, of, of serious players, then they have the promise of winning many more victories, uh, legislative victories in the future that they care about. So th um, I, would, I would be making their, their focus on that if I were them. I'm not sure I buy that. Uh, and it's not because I, I can't see the play, but it's the time frame. This is uh, a very fragile government, no matter what the recounts end up uh, with. Uh, and it's not going to be around for more than two years. I can't see anything like that happening in that time frame. I also note that the last time British Columbians were asked about this, almost two thirds of them opted for the current system. Yeah, and, so and it's not a given that they would right. actually buy in uh, to uh, a reform over such a short time frame. I think uh -huh. many British Columbians would say they have possibly other priorities that they would like. Uh, to be front yeah. and center. Okay, I'm way over the limit. <laughs> and you both had your say. All right. And we enjoyed it. <laughs> Thanks, Paul, for joining us this week. Thank Chantel you. in Montreal and Andrew here in Toronto. Rex is up next. Stay with us. This is the story of building the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Between Jasper and Red Pass, a start is made. All the latest weapons employed by engineers in modern pipeline construction converge on the theaters of war. The enemy, one by one, toppling to echoing cries of timber. And the steel monsters arrive. To 140 sidings from Edmonton to Vancouver, 5,000 railway flat cars bring their loads of pipes and then to their individual prearranged spots in the continuous chain. They're linked together by a complicated process that assures 100% accuracy. The pipe is 24 inches in diameter, and every inch of it must be evenly coated. And then, check and recheck. Then a wrapping is added, made from glass, felt, and asbestos as the men observe their finished product laid to rest. A continuous tube, liquid railway, stretching 718 miles. The big question is, of course, whether there is life on Mars, and the short answer is that it's not impossible. No one knows what Mars really looks like, but this week, streaming back from deep space is the best information in history bringing us nearer the answers concerning the origin of life, whether man is something special or a special freak. The search for life on Mars is still continuing. Data received from the Viking landers have puzzled NASA scientists, and within the past two days, they've been able to confirm that the ice caps of Mars are really frozen water, not carbon dioxide as once believed. So the chances of finding life get better with each passing day. 
Its past was hostile and torn by meteors. Its present is cold and barren. A colony here would seem a futile fantasy. But today's dreamers are scientists, and they do their dreaming for NASA. I think the possibility of Mars as a second home for mankind is very important for our future as a race. The students are building a prototype Martian colony called Marsville. It's on Earth, but they do understand what it will take to settle on Mars. The temperature on Mars is a lot colder than on Earth. And these students understand cooperation is the only way to get to Mars. I mean, with all the technology they have now, we could have somebody go up pretty soon. They've come from all over the world for this meeting of the International Mars Society. They've got bumper stickers. They've got a Martian flag already picked out. The one question that always comes up is this. Is it worth the many billions more to put people on the surface of the red planet rather than just machines? The Mars fans here admit the barriers are huge, but they also say we have the capability and the money to get to Mars. All we need now is the will to do it. To find out more, we need to go out into space, and space research, like politics, is the art of the possible. What we would like to do must be weighed against what we can do. The problems that gave W.A.C. Wacky Bennett and Bill Fantasy Gardens van der Zam to Canada's political heritage can make a serious claim to originality in politics. But I must take exception to the many sage observers insisting that B.C. politics is uniquely weird or the strangest in all of Canada, and that Tuesday's result with some ballots still not tabulated, almost certainly a judicial recount or two, is a high watermark of weird and strange politics. As a proud Newfoundlander, I must protest. It might be 50 years ago, but the last Smallwood election still has no parallel. The results were 20 for the Smallwood Liberals, 21 for the Tories, and one independent tie. On top of that, six districts had less than 100 vote majority, and one as minuscule as eight votes. And in that district, in a fit of pyromania or despair, the returning officer in the town of Sally's Cove burned all the ballots sometime in the early hours of 2 or 3 a.m., consigning the district to recount limbo in a hell of an election. I leave out of the story the buying and selling of the one independent candidate, the oceans of rum that lubricated all negotiations, midnight press conferences, 2 a.m. TV appearances, and the nightmares of the lieutenant governor of the day. Compared to that, B.C. politics today is a model of sanity, elegance, and clarity. Still, Tuesday was interesting. It made Andrew Weaver the most powerful green leader in the country. Should Mr. Weaver back the NDP, ideologically likely, what becomes of the Kinder Morgan pipeline? What becomes of the compact between Mr. Trudeau and Premier Christy Clark, which seemingly guaranteed the go-ahead? What becomes of Mr. Trudeau's celebrated equilibrium between jobs and the environment, his delicate shuffle? between fervent climate change policies and a depressed Alberta economy. In the shadow of the anniversary of the Fort McMurray flames, the crash of the oil economy, the PM's keeping promise that Alberta's resources will not be landlocked by a British Columbia veto, keeping that will strain his wits and ours. An NDP government in BC will also bring heartache, ironically, to an NDP government in Alberta, a novel friction. Ms. Notley and Mr. Horgan share the same political flag, but on oil and pipelines, they march in different parades. Likewise, should Mr. Weaver back Christy Clark, what concessions on the same issue will she have to make? And then, of course, there's Donald Trump. Here is always Donald Trump. What if Clark's threatened retaliations to U.S. thermal coal shipping out of B.C.? Now, quarreling with Trump, is undeniably inviting and even delicious. But with NAFTA under threat, can Mr. Trudeau afford to indulge that wonderful vocation? Mr. Weaver's green beachhead then his, hits both Edmonton and Ottawa. So the BC election, while calm by Newfoundland's ancient standards, has set 
many cats among not a few pigeons. For The National, I'm Rex Murphy. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Tomorrow on The Current, the pundits, the pollsters, the political world said she'd win. But Hillary Clinton was doomed to fail to become the first female U.S. president. Hear why on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. Baby, my heart's on fire. Five years ago today, the first telephones went on sale to the public. To give you an idea what sort of a telephone you could buy at that time, we asked the telephone company to dust off some of the ancient models stored in the basement of its University Avenue building. This attractive demonstration wasn't really in keeping with the telephone scenes of 1877. Originally, boys were employed as telephone operators. They were later replaced by girls when it was found they were too rude to customers. And this is something else that's in use now and will one day be a part of every home. It's called the video phone. If I'm off center, you can't see me anymore. So, uh... You'd only want to do that if uh, you weren't properly dressed. The size, the shape, and the color has changed a little in the past 30 years, but it still does the same thing. Or does it? The fact is that the system to which this phone is connected has changed radically. Now this uses the phone, and this does, and so does this. The telecommunications industry has produced an electronic highway. Tim Barnett is checking in with his office. Hello, buddy. He's using his new high-tech cellular phone. It's got no wires, no jacks, and it travels anywhere. The people selling it claim it's the productivity tool of the 80s. It could equally be an expensive bust. To have her call me on my uh, cellular phone, I'd appreciate it. This gadget doesn't come cheap. It costs between $2,000 and $6,000 just to get the equipment, and there's call charges on top of that. Yesterday, they were gadgets used only by the rich and powerful. Today, your local pizza delivery is likely to have one. And in next to no time, so will most of us who want to have that phone, no matter where we happen to be. Research in Motion dominates a small industrial park in Waterloo, Ontario. It invented and manufactures a pager called a BlackBerry. Its unique feature, a keyboard that allows you to send and receive email, essentially in real time. Now, when Apple says it plans to make a new cell phone, people listen. Today, the company showed off its iPhone with well, a Samsung touch screen. Samsung has brought its fight for smartphone supremacy to Apple's turf. If you refuse me, honey, you lose me, then you'll be left alone. Oh, baby, telephone. And tell me I'm your own. The National. The National. Well, a different perspective now on our top story, the sudden firing of the FBI director, the potential damage to Donald Trump. While he's deeply unpopular by some measures, polls suggest only a tiny fraction of his voters regret their decision. The CBC's Karen Polls went to North Dakota, which heavily voted for Trump, to see whether the latest Washington drama changes anything. Ian, Casey, Todd, Mickle. It's opening Carson, week of the Grand Fork Softball Connor, League. Play ball? Very exciting. Look forward to it every year. Ben Haves doesn't know much about the Comey controversy and doesn't much care. His take on Donald Trump's presidency, right it's had more hits than misses. He's trying anyway. And I can respect somebody who's trying to make a difference. North Dakota is reliably Republican. In last year's election, two out of three people here voted for Donald Trump. And the general feeling so far is he hasn't made a bad call. I think they see a lot of the 
you know, national media's sort of negativity toward him as, you know, a, a justification perhaps of their own vote for him. You know, that he was going in there to bust up the, you know, political elites to drain the swamp and that this is causing people they distrust, you know, the political elites in Washington discomfort and this to them is a positive thing. But what does it, These it, card-carrying it, Republican it, students it, are scanning it, the headlines. They're not impressed. That. Yeah, both sides had argued at their own point in time so hard to have the guy pulled out and as soon as you know the president trump decides to it turns into a scandal they know the timing of comey's dismissal raises questions but benjamin olson says trump is doing what all new presidents do we believe that there are many individuals in our government in the bureaucracy especially that are not doing things for the best interests of America. And I think that this is one thing that Trump is looking forward to is replacing these people. He's actually moved forward on something. And for any Republican president, that's pretty close to what they would have done. It's nothing too off the wall. Not everyone agrees with that. Comey is also the guy that's investigating him about his Russian ties and whatnot. He's firing someone that's investigating him, someone that could also bring a uh, upon a impeachment. We approached several women for their opinions, but none would come on camera. Oh yeah, beautiful. But back at the softball game, Ben Hafes has as much confidence in Donald Trump as he does in his team. We should be able to put him down pretty quick. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Grand Forks, North Dakota. Well now for a very different perspective about a very different thing. This is a drone's eye view of an ancient Bolivian civilization. The site of Tiwanaku could date back as far as 1500 BC and was once a major cultural center. It's home to multiple UN World Heritage protected ruins. But since its discovery in the 16th century, it has been badly damaged by scavengers. Researchers are using drone imaging to better understand how to preserve the ruins. 7.8 million dollars is a lot of money, but at a diamond auction today it was simply not enough. A 709 carat stone was up for bidding by the government of Sierra Leone on behalf of the finder, a Christian pastor. But when even the top bid didn't meet the valuation of the diamond, the pastor decided to wait on a better offer. Finally tonight, a film festival happening right now in Toronto is working to change an important part of the entertainment industry, how it represents people with disabilities. Stephanie Van Kampen explains. This is my whole world. My nurse, my mom, my sickness. That sickness is severe combined immunodeficiency, and it's at the center of the new movie version of the teen novel Everything Everything. The main character Maddie falls in love, but can't leave her home for fear of infection. This isn't living. It's a prime example of a tired trope used too often in the arts, disease or disability as an obstacle for a character to overcome. And it's dangerous, according to this film critic. That's not really a realistic way of thinking about being a disabled person in the world. You don't simply turn off your disability. You don't simply cure your disability or transcend your disability. It's something that you live with every day. But Everything Everything's Canadian director says that's not the point of the film. The book is not about a disease. And I think the greater themes of like love and um, what you'd risk for love um, kind of are paramount over that. Similar criticisms have been launched at last year's movie Me Before You that ended in the main character choosing death over living with a disability. He makes people feel things, but what does, what he, does feel? he feel? Meanwhile, a new Toronto play is delving into disability without explicitly portraying it. Based on Ian Brown's memoir about caring for his disabled son, The Boy in the Moon talks about the worth and meaning of a disabled life. The play invites the audience uh, into that journey as well, and which, which means asking some candid questions about personhood, about knowability, um, about the soul inside uh, of an individual that is very hard to access. Um, and that does make it, um, that does make it uh, a, a sensitive story to tell. In order to do that, the play doesn't show the boy with the disability, but rather focuses on his parents. There was no satisfying uh, or correct way to show Walker, uh, to have Walker represented by an able-bodied actor. 
The mandate here at Real Abilities Film Festival is to shine a spotlight on films by, for and about people with disabilities. It's really important that filmmakers with disabilities are telling their own stories. This year, the film festival has added new workshops for filmmakers. The film festival is also hoping to expand into more Canadian cities in the coming years. Stephanie Van Campen, CBC News, Toronto. Well, it's The National this Thursday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching. Thank you.